This is the first lecture in the final third of the course. Now this is the section of the course that's probably responsible for persuading most of you to sign up to take the course. This is the section of the course in which we discuss the controversy between modern evolutionary biology and modern creationism. This is also the kind of uh, the area of discussion in which people are most likely to get upset and f feel offended. So let me say something that I've said before in this class, but I'll say it again now, and that is I have an opinion, of course. I have a point of view. I don't really try to hide it. And you are not required to agree with my point of view. You're only required to understand it. In your essays, if you want to take a position that's the opposite of my position, you're perfectly free to do so. Uh, the teaching assistant who will read your essays has been instructed not to penalize you if you disagree with me, not to reward you if you agree with me. You're going to be graded entirely on the quality of your arguments in your essays. Now, as usual, I have posted my own uh, pri uh, personal lecture outline on Canvas in the file section of this course. It might be a good idea if you downloaded those at, before you watch the rest of the lecture so that you can follow along. That's the way I do it. It's not a requirement, of course, but that's the way I do it. Uh, among other reasons, for this particular lecture, I have a bunch of statistics, public opinion statistics and that sort of thing. And I could hold up my lecture notes to the camera, but that wouldn't be very efficient. So what I'm planning to do is I'm just going to refer to the various statistics and whatnot that are in my personal lecture notes, and you should be able just to look down at the paper that's in front of you and see what I'm talking about. Also, in this third section of the course, I had, I was going to show you two documentaries. Well, uh, that's hard to do under these circumstances. So I'm going to cancel the showing of the revisionaries. I'm not going to ask you to uh, watch it unless you want to. It's, it's very interesting if you're interested in politics and evolution, especially if you're interested in Texas politics and evolution. The, the documentary, The Revisionaries, is about the politics of the uh, State Board of Education. Uh, but as I say, I'm not requiring that you see that one, but it might be interesting to you. I am still requiring that you watch the video uh, that's entitled Unlocking the Mystery of Life. I think that's the title of it. Unlocking the Mystery of Life, yes. And you can find that documentary in 12 chapters on YouTube. So you go to YouTube, you put in Unlocking the Mystery of Life, and there'll be on the side, Unlocking the Mystery of Life, Chapter 1, and you can watch that. And then Unlocking the Mystery of Life, Chapter 2, and you can watch all 12 chapters. Unlocking the Mystery of Life is a documentary that was made at the behest of the Discovery Institute, which is the most important creationist in, uh, institution in this whole controversy here. And so I want you to be able to get their argument in their own words from their own lips. I don't want you to have to rely upon me interpreting their argument for you. I'm going to do that, of course, but don't rely upon that. Go and hear what they have to say about themselves and their ideas for themselves. All right.
It's the politics of evolution in modern America. There are two questions which sometimes show up in public opinion surveys, uh, depending upon how they're asked what it is. The, the first question is basically, do you accept the theory of evolution, the scientific theory of evolution, or do you think that uh, the, the first book of Genesis, that particular creation myth, is actually the truth about how we all got here? Uh, the second question is about what do you think we should teach in public school biology classes? Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the public opinion survey results. Uh, and I might point out that I took one of these public opinion surveys. I am, after all, a social scientist. So let's talk now about public opinion and evolution. Here are some historical discussions. If you look down at your own page, you'll see that in uh, 1981, 38% of the public, in 2007, 36, and in 2017, uh, about that much percentage of the American public said that humans, this is, and this is important, humans, or man, however the question is asked, humans did in fact evolve, but with a guiding hand from God. Second down below that are the answers when it says, man developed and God, uh, God had no part in the process. In other words, the actual scientific uh, teaching on how we all got here. And you'll see that in 8107 and 17, it's 9%, 13%, and 19%. And then below that, it's for 81, 7, and 17, it's God created man in his present form. In other words, an opinion that completely rejects the theory of evolution. And you will see that somewhere from 38 to 46 percent of the American public, or in, in other words, in some cases, almost a majority, flatly rejects the scientific explanation for how life and humans got on this planet. So when we're talking, uh, say, at, the, at a university, among professors and students, uh, among people who are very likely to accept the theory of evolution as truth, we always have to remember that at least two-fifths of the American public rejects the scientific explanation completely. Down below that, I have some public opinion uh, uh, results from various groups in the United States. Uh, and one of the things you see here is that people who, and right down at the bottom, people who have uh, no religion, basically, accept the theory of evolution, but people who are religious tend to reject the theory of evolution. And there are some variations in race and some other things, and we could get uh, much more uh, detailed if we wanted to, but the main point is that a large percentage of the American public rejects the theory of evolution, just doesn't believe in it. On the next page, I have some comparative st statistics from various countries. And the question is, human beings, as we know them today, develop from earlier species of animals. And it's the percentage in each country that uh, says true or mostly true. You know, there's a five-point scale. True or mostly true. And if you look at that, you see that in Iceland, 85% of the public say it's true or mostly true. And down at the bottom is 27% Turkey. But the country that has the second highest number of people who do not believe in the theory of evolution is the United States. And in fact, Texas is 
uh, almost as close to Turkey as it is to the country as a whole. Within Texas, there's a very large percentage of people who reject the theory of evolution. Now in 2010, I injected some questions into the Texas poll. My colleague and friend Darren Shaw runs the Texas poll. And one day we were riding up in Bats Hall together in the elevator and I said, say Darren, do you have some extra space in the next Texas poll for three questions on evolution? He said, yeah, we do have some extra space. So I went home and typed them up and gave them to him. And we now know some results from the state of Texas, your friends and neighbors and family, about the theory of evolution. So, a look at the first one, which I have here as question 45. Human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God guided the process, 38%. Human beings have developed over millions of years some less advanced forms of life, and God had no part in the process, 12%. God created human beings pretty much in their present form about 10,000 years ago. That's the biblical uh, story. And don't know 12%. So what you see here is, first, I want to point out, it makes a difference as to whether you say life evolved or God created life makes a difference between that kind of question and a question that asks human beings were created or human beings evolved. What these statistics show is that there's a chunk of the American and Texas public, 10 to 15 percent, who will say yes, life evolved but no, humans did not evolve. The second point that's of interest is that if you just say, just ask if they believe in evolution, did life evolve uh, just naturally with no supernatural help, a, a large percentage of Texans reject that possibility. But if you say yes, life evolved, but God guided the process. Then about 15% more of the Texas population will endorse this compromised view of what's going on. Now, of course, people in the sciences utterly reject the idea that God guided the process of evolution. So when people endorse that, that view. They're, they're making kind of a political compromise. They're saying, yeah, kind of, I, will, I, I don't want to reject either my religion or uh, the theory of evolution. I'd like to kind of uh, embrace both. But that, of course, is not the scientific view. So the first question, 45, is about humans. The next one, question 46, which of the following statements comes closest to your view on the origin and development of life on Earth? First one was humans. The second question is life on Earth. And what you see here is that more people, in fact a majority of Texans, are willing to accept the evolution of life if God guided the process. Fewer Texans are willing to insist that God created life as we know it uh, in a, a few thousand years ago if we're talking about life as opposed to humans. So we have two variables that are important here. One is whether we're asking about life or humans, and the other is whether we are uh, insisting upon a naturalistic explanation or allowing some supernatural guidance to come into the 
process of evolution. And however you mix up those various parts of questions, you get different answers. There is what you might call a hard core of maybe 25% of the Texas population that absolutely rejects evolution, period. But if you bring in these other variables, then the uh, percentage of people who will accept some version of evolution goes up. Now finally, question 47. <clears throat> this says, please tell us whether you agree or disagree with the following statement. Human beings, as we know them today, develop from earlier species of animals. And then once again, we're talking about human beings, so you see the results there. And finally, question 48. Please tell us whether you agree or disagree with the following statement. The earliest humans lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. And you will see that 29% that of the Texas population agrees that humans lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. This question and the results got me on the national news for the only time in my career. The fact that 29% of Texans believed that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, let, made some national news shows, and created uh, such a stir in some quarters that there was a cartoon about it. It appeared in various newspapers. Let me summarize uh, this portion of the lecture then. Uh, according to public opinion polls, a very significant percentage of American citizens from a third to two-fifths rejects the theory of evolution outright. But the proportion varies uh, a great deal depending on how the question is worded. Uh, the percentage of people willing to grant that some kind of evolution occurred uh, rises 10 to 15 percent if the phrase, but God guided the process, is added. And more people are willing to endorse the possibility of evolution if the question is about life in general rather than humans in particular. So let's go on to now to the other question we're considering about, is, which is about whether Americans endorse uh, teaching evolution or creationism in public school biology classes. And as you'll see down here, under B, opinion about teaching the theory of public school science classes. In 1999, 58% of, of uh, Americans favored teaching both creationism and evolution in public schools. In 2006, 68% favored teaching both creationism and uh, uh, science. And then in Pew, the Pew Center asked in 2005, do you favor teaching creationism only in public schools? 38% of the American public favored teaching creationism only and not teaching evolution at all. And we know that these percentages would be higher in the South. There are probably at least 50% in Texas. So, what we're dealing with here is a, in many ways, a conflict between science and democracy. That is, if we really allowed parents, citizens, to decide the curriculum of public schools, it's entirely possible that in very many states, including Texas, we would not be teaching scientific biology in public school biology classes, we would be teaching biblical creationism. So, for the next section of this lecture now, I'm going to talk about the legal context of this issue, about what, we, what people believe and what we should teach in public schools. So, the philosophical controversy is, do majorities have the authority 
to set the curriculum, the curriculum of public school biology classes. Uh, the position that's dominated American education since, well, at least the beginning of the 20th century, is what's called the wall of separation theory. The wall of separation comes from uh, two letters that Thomas Jefferson wrote in the 18th century. And the wall of separation theory is that it, it's improper for government to endorse or support religion in any way. Government should not be hostile to religion, but it should not help or encourage religion. This is the interpretation of the First Amendment, which now governs American law. Jefferson's position that there should be a wall of separation between church and state. Millions of people, of course, disagree with this position and have disagreed with it. Uh, other pe uh, people could, um, interpret the First Amendment to mean that government should do what it can to encourage religious belief, but that it, it should not play favorites among religions. It should encourage all religions impartially. There's also one another view which is held by a small percentage of people, some of whom, however, are very rich, who argue that the U.S. is a Christian nation and that the government should favor Christian doctrine and uh, more or less suppress non-Christian views. Uh, neither of those other views, the, the non-wall of separation views, dominates, but they're both there and they're both held fervently by a lot of people. So the bottom line at this moment, we'll go over this in more detail later, at this moment in American jurisprudence, the reigning doctrine is that public schools should be secular. Now, the word secular means non-religious. It does not mean anti-religious. The reigning view in American law is that public schools should not push any religious doctrine. That doesn't mean they should push an anti-religious doctrine. It's just, among other things, it means that in science classes, they should teach science and only science. And that, of course, that view that dominates American law, which means American judges and American lawyers, that view is contrary to the view held by a very large chunk of the American public. The problem is that secular schools, a secular society, is perceived by many religious people as being hostile to them. That is, they don't think that we can have a secular society and a religious society uh, existing side by side peacefully. They think that secular is by definition anti-religious and they think that uh, the parents think that teaching their children a secular theory such as the theory of evolution in public schools is an attack on their religious views there are millions of people who feel this way and they feel strongly so there is an undercurrent of hostility to the public schools among a large percentage of the American public. Okay, well, let's talk about the development of constitutional law uh, on this particular issue. So first, in the early 1960s, the federal courts, the Supreme Court, began to make decisions that forced uh, American society to be more secular, especially forced our public schools to be more secular. Um, 
When I was uh, living in Pennsylvania uh, in 1962, uh, a very small town in Pennsylvania, I was in the ninth grade and we began every uh, school day with a prayer, a Christian prayer. Very many uh, states did that. I had come from California. We did not begin our school day with a prayer in California. States differed very much on this. In 1962, in the uh, decision of Engel versus Vitale, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court held that prayers in public schools, are officially endorsed prayers, or officially sponsored prayers in public schools were unconstitutional. Now, now what that mean, that does not mean that a child cannot pray in school. You know, oh, oh God, please let me get an A on this test. I'll bet you've done that. Uh, that's not unconstitutional. What is unconstitutional is officially sponsored prayer. That is, a teacher leading a prayer in front of a class, or uh, the principal leading a prayer uh, at a gathering, uh, an assembly. Uh, that particular Supreme Court decision, Engel versus Vitale, has always been unpopular with a large percentage of the American public. And various people uh, in Congress are always trying to push a constitutional amendment to overturn it. But so far, it's the law. <clears throat> what the Supreme Court held was that to make students either participate in a Christian prayer, whether they're Christians or not, or listen silently in a room where everybody else is praying, violates the no establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment. Now, if you have trouble understanding this point, that is, if you're a Christian and you don't understand why, say, a Jew in a classroom just can't be silent why, while everybody else says their Christian prayers, I try a thought experiment. Try yourself, be, uh, imagine yourself as the only Christian in a public school classroom and everyone else is reciting an Islamic prayer uh, from the Quran. Uh, you're not forced to participate, but you must stand there silently while everyone else recites the Islamic prayer. Would you be offended and feel pressured? Well, I myself have imagined myself that way, and I think I would. And the Supreme Court held, yes, it's an unconstitutional pressure on non-Christians if a Christian prayer is officially sponsored by the school. So it's unconstitutional. You can't do it anymore. Now, there are some school districts generally small town school districts in the South where people still ignore the Supreme Court decision from 1962. It's possible that you were educated in one of those small towns and you grew up going to school and having prayers in school. I understand that. It happens. Uh, but what I'm talking about is constitutional law, not what every single student in the country experiences. Well, there were some other expansions of the Engel versus Vitale decision. Uh, in Lee versus Weissman in 1992, the Supreme Court held that you could not have prayers led by clergy at high school graduation ceremonies. In Santa Fe School District versus Doe, that's Santa Fe, Texas, not Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe School District versus Doe, 2000, the Supreme Court held you could not have student-led prayers at high school football games. <clears throat> Earlier in Lemon versus Kurtzman, which I'm going to talk about some more, 
In Lemon versus Kurtzman, the Supreme Court put forward what is now called the Lemon Test to help decide when you could have religion and government working together. And the Lemon Test is three parts. It says, first, the government's action must have a secular legislative purpose. What that means basically is that if you uh, are distributing face masks uh, and uh, plastic gloves to all schools during the coronavirus epidemic, you can administer uh, that, you can distribute them to religious schools also. It's because the purpose of a face mask, it, it's not a religious purpose, it's a medical purpose. So you can give face masks to religious schools uh, just as, as legally as you can give them to public schools. The second one is, uh, the second rule, government's actions must not have the primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. Uh, there's too much complication there for me to go into much detail, just the point is that you can't help religion. You can say uh, the Puritans held the first Thanksgiving, but you can't say uh, the Puritans who were right about how we should worship God had the first Thanksgiving. The third rule is the government's action must not result in excessive government entanglement with religion. This third rule has caused a lot of trouble. It's hard to interpret. There have been many court cases over the uh, uh, decades about what exactly it means. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in, a, in, in detail. I just want to say that the bottom line rule now in American public schools is American public schools should be secular. The most famous court case in uh, American history on teaching evolution in the schools was not a federal case. It was in this, a state court in Tennessee in 1925. It's the Scopes trial. Uh, you will often hear the Scopes trial referred to as the monkey trial. Uh, it wasn't really about monkeys. <laughs> it was a, 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 a Tennessee law had been passed. That is, a state law had been passed <coughs> forbidding the teaching of evolution in Tennessee public school biology classes. And John Scopes, who was a high school uh, biology teacher, defied the law and taught in his class and was quickly arrested and tried. And uh, he was found guilty because he was guilty of violating that particular law. But the political powers that be in, uh, in I think it was Dayton, Tennessee, were very concerned because this uh, trial attracted international publicity and basically made Dayton a laughingstock and among uh, sophisticated opinion. And the people uh, who ran the town were worried that this would be bad for business, this uh, bad reputation. So they consulted with the judge. And when Scopes was uh, convicted, the judge fined him $100, which basically was not very important. And then uh, the, the verdict was appealed and the Tennessee Supreme Court overturned the conviction on a technicality. So the importance of the Scopes trial is not that anything important happened or that John Scopes was published or any, uh, punished or anything like that. It's important in that it became a sort of a symbol, a rallying point for people who wanted to keep evolution out of the schools. Now there's a famous movie, it was first a famous play, Famous movie, if you want to see the movie, the movie is entitled Inherit the Wind. Inherit the Wind. It was, uh, came out in 1960. And it's a fictionalized version of the Scopes trial. 
And if you want to watch the movie, you might want to read a little history in Wikipedia on the actual trial first, because you'll see that there are some differences uh, that the people who made the movie took some poetic license with the fiction. Uh, but at any rate, it's, it's, uh, it is uh, made by liberals, by pro-evolution people. And it uh, casts the anti-evolution people as a vicious hicks. It's propaganda, liberal propaganda in other words. But you might want to see it, it's an interesting film. Uh, it is also, by the way, the answer to a trivia question. So here's now your, answer, uh, your uh, opportunity to dazzle your roommates. The question is, what is the first commercial movie ever shown on a plane flight in the United States? And the answer is, Inherit the Wind was shown on a TWA cross-country flight in 1960. Let's go on. Now then, in this section of the lecture, I'm going to talk about the theory of evolution and the party battle, that is, the political party battle. Now, the uh, United States is not the only country in the world in which the theory of evolution is politically contested. Uh, for example, uh, in 2017, all mention of Darwin and the theory of evolution was removed from public schools in the country of Turkey. Turkey's president, Recep Erdogan, is a fundamentalist Muslim, and the Muslim creation story is more or less the same as the Jewish Christian creation story, the Genesis story. But, we're interested here in the United States and there is organized political opposition to the theory of evolution, especially in terms of teaching it in the public schools. Uh, fundamentalist Protestantism is much stronger in the South, including Texas, than it is in other countries, uh, I'm sorry, in other states. Now let me talk about that. A fundamentalist, what is a fundamentalist? A fundamentalist is someone who believes that every word of the Bible, if you're Christian, or of the Quran, if you're Muslim, every word of the Bible, Old Testament and New, is true, literally true. That is a fundamentalist Christian, or for that matter, a fundamentalist Jew, believes that God created the universe, the earth, all life on earth, including humans, in six days about 6,000 years ago. Uh, I assigned you, in the first part of this course, I assigned you to read the first part of the book of Genesis. And I presume you did that reading. And so, fundamentalist Christians believe that that, that part of the book of Genesis is literally true history. Uh, for most of political history uh, in the United States, fundamentalist Protestants in the South were on the other side of the political fence from uh, conservative uh, capitalist uh, people in the, in the United States. That is, the, conserva the economically conservative capitalists were basically Republicans and the fundamentalist Christian uh, Southerners were basically Democrats for a large part of American history, that was the way it worked. And so the uh, business people, by and large, were pro-evolution. And the uh, Southern fundamentalists, by and large, were anti-evolution and so they didn't get together. They were in different parties. They were Republicans and Democrats. But in 1980, Ronald Reagan, Republican, put together a new coalition, a coalition of conservative, economically conservative capitalists and socially conservative fundamentalist Christians. So since 1980, fundamentalist Christians 
and capitalists have been on the same side of the fence in the Republican Party. So, since 1980, a large part of the Republican Party has been anti-evolution. Reagan himself, this is not something that's generally made well known, but Reagan himself, during the campaign of 1980, he not only took an anti-abortion policy stance, he took an anti-evolution policy stance. And various other Republicans since Reagan have also been publicly anti-evolution. George W. Bush, for example, former governor of Texas, was anti-evolution. However, sometimes the capitalists don't agree with the anti-evolution people. Most of the time, uh, economic conservatives and, so and uh, social conservatives vote together. That is, when anti-abortion legislation comes up in the Texas legislature, the uh, economic conservative Republicans vote for it, and the social conservative Republicans vote for, for it. There's no conflict there. But when anti-evolution uh, bills come up, sometimes the uh, business people split from the fundamentalists because the business people think that having a generation of Texans who don't know biology or basically have been miseducated in science that that's going to be bad for business in Texas. So sometimes when that happens, the business conservatives break away from the social conservatives and join the Democrats. And that's been what's been going on in Texas, both in the legislature and in the Board of Education, for about 20 years now. So, what do we find in the party as a whole? in the, <clears throat> because I co-author a textbook on Texas politics, and because I write the chapter on political parties, every two years I read the state Republican and Democratic state platforms. So I have, on page seven here, my outline, I have uh, some quotations from the Texas Republican platform in 2014, and 2018. And if you read those, I'm not going to read them all here, but you can read them. You see that officially the Texas Republican Party is anti evolution and it doesn't say we shouldn't teach science in public schools, but what it basically says is we should teach science and we should teach the book of Genesis. Also, I have here a bill that was submitted into the Texas House in 2013. And basically what it would have done if it had passed is it would have forced public schools to teach intelligent design, which is the modern way we discuss creationism. I'm going to let you read those. So, in the United States in general, and in Texas and the South in particular, the Republican Party is often, very often, officially anti-evolution, although in practice, sometimes it splits and it's not so anti-evolution. There's also interest groups who are fighting this political fight. Uh, Scientists are overwhelmingly in favor of teaching the theory of evolution without any reference to a supernatural force in public schools. Educators are overwhelmingly in favor of it, although not 100%, but a very large majority are overwhelmingly in favor of it. There's a certain 
uh, strata of very educated public opinion, the kind of people who subscribe to the New York Times. They're in favor of teaching the theory of evolution without any supernaturalism. But there's also a big chunk of people, probably a majority in the southern states, who would prefer that their children who go to public schools be taught both creationism and evolution, or just creationism. And it is uh, because that's not what the courts have allowed, because the courts have insisted that schools be secular, that's one of the reasons why so many Christians homeschool their children, because they don't want to have to teach the theory, or they don't want their kids taught the theory of evolution. Technically, homeschooling parents are supposed to teach the theory of evolution, but if you know anything about human nature and politics, you know that probably they're, that's not what they're doing. So, uh, creationists are very strong in the United States, and you can get all the creationist literature, all the creationist arguments that you want, uh, on the, on the web, and I have put down a, uh, a website on the lecture notes here. <coughs> a website in which, that lists creationists, uh, all the creationist websites I can find, thousands of them. Creationists, and this is, it's important to discuss this, creationists are of two types. There are young earth creationists. They are fundamentalists. That is, young earth creationists believe that the earth was created about 6,000 years ago in six days and that, uh, that the Adam and Eve story is literally true history. Uh, they believe that most of the geological formations we see on earth and the fossils we see on earth are the result of Noah's flood. Uh, young earth creationists have constructed a whole counter cosmology to explain uh, geological facts, uh, physics, chemistry, everything else. There are whole libraries of books that create a counter-science to the, the one we have now. Here's one called, In the Beginning, Compelling Evidence for Creation and the Flood. This is a very long book by a learned person talking about physics and chemistry and geology and explaining to you why science, his science, Walt Brown is the name, Science supports the interpretation that the book of Genesis is actual true history. Here's another one by Bruce Malone. Science censored the suppressed evidence. This is all about how uh, the scientists in charge of our scientific establishment have suppressed the truth that the theory of evolution is a lie and the real truth is to be found in the book of Genesis. Here's a book by Danny Faulkner, Dr. Danny Faulkner, Universe by Design, an Explanation of Cosmology and Creationism. This is basically a book for children that explains why the uh, theory of evolution that they're taught in school is a lie and tells them the counter-truth that it is the book of Genesis that holds the real truth about how we all got here. In terms of the sheer number of people and what people believe, young earth creationists are probably a majority uh, in the creationist community. Uh, but the intellectual dominance is by another type of creationist. 
It's the intelligent design creation. Now, I'm not going to talk any more about young earth creationists. The interesting creationists, from my point of view, are the intelligent design people. The documentary I've asked you to watch, uh, Unlocking the Mystery of Life, is a documentary by and about intelligent design creationists. They are centered on the Discovery Institute, which is an organization in Seattle. When you watched the uh, documentary Expelled, in which Ben Stein went to Seattle and went and interviewed, the people he was talking to were people at the Discovery Institute, and he was talking about intelligent design creationism there. Uh, intelligent design people insist that they are not doing religion. And what they're doing is actually not creationism. They would object to me saying the phrase intelligent design creationism. We are not creationists, they say. What they say is and you'll see this when you watch Unlocking the Mystery of Life. They say, using scientific methods and scientific reasoning, we can show you that the theory of evolution is wrong, 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 and that the evidence supports the interpretation that life has an intelligent designer. Now, an intelligent designer, they insist, is not the same thing as God. And we'll go through that, uh, that claim later. But the point is that they say that what they are really doing is science. Counter science. And that their science is true. And the Darwinian establishment science is wrong. Uh, however, there are other organizations, pro-evolution organizations. The most important one is the one called the National Center for Science Education. Uh, it was uh, founded in 1983 to keep track of and oppose efforts to inject creationism into the public schools. It's affiliated with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It monitors state legislatures and other governments, uh, among others the Texas State Board of Education. It sends around a quarterly printed newspaper. It uh, sends around emails. It uh, rallies and coordinates the pro-evolution, pro-science minority to support secular public schools. And the, uh, the Discovery Institute and the National Center for Science Education have very often clashed in court and in state legislatures, battling over what we're going to teach in our public schools. Uh, and I'm going to end that now, but we will pick up these threads in another lecture.